hello friends on youtube i uh, welcome to today's episode i hope you have sound and uh, my sound and the video going on great to have you all here on youtube it's not started yet whatever it is just started just started okay started man yeah that's that typical lag oh okay there's <laughs> a yes. 5 minute lag sir in youtube yeah oh okay yeah about a minute lag is there and maybe today it's a little slower like me <laughs> today i'm having one of those days like i was telling nandini that i felt even my coffee needs coffee to get on <laughs> so <laughs> happens sometimes can you can play the video the video is play audio starts after 2 minutes this is for us to test our audio Greetings and welcome to the Oral Pathology 360 channel. This is the 65th episode. And if this is your first time, I'm Dr. Mandana Donahue. I love oral pathology and that's why I set up Oral Pathology India, 
to celebrate oral pathology in the home of the largest oral pathology fraternity in the world and oral pathology 360 to get oral pathology where it belongs within the larger context of dentistry, general pathology and patient care. Now, if you, have, you would like to join us and you haven't done so before, please subscribe. And now coming to today. We have a wonderful session. Our guest speaker today is someone who is very well known for his most captivating lectures. Always interesting. There have been people who have been waiting for him for this lecture for the last week. So it's great and wonderful to have you here. So Dr. Subramaniam, of course, he will be introduced in detail by Dr. Nandini. Dr. Nandini is moderating the session today and she happens to be Dr. Subramaniam's student. So that's quite an interesting day. And uh, she is herself a very dedicated and talented oral pathologist in her own right. She's a professor and head department of oral pathology and microbiology dental college, regional institute of medical sciences in Pal, Manipur, India. She's a passionate academician with over 19 years of experience and many presentations. She's a researcher of repute with over 60 publications and an active member in the review and editorial board of various journals. She is presently the co-editor of the Indian Oral Pathology Journal, that's our association journal, the JOMFP. She presented a talk on this channel about pediatric neoplasms, which is her current and I would say her definite favorite for many years, actually. She actively supports this channel and promotes oral pathology. Actually, we have worked together before and because she's also worked with me in the last department where I was working and we have conducted many events, including the S.E. Shroff Symposium on Evidence-Based Oral and Maxillofacial Pathology, which was a part of the Living Legends Symposium that was held in 2013. And she did a marvelous job being the organizing secretary of that event. Uh, with that, now I will stop sharing and I will request her to please introduce Subramaniam sir and start the session. Ma'am, thank you so much for your kind introduction. And uh, today is a privileged day for me, for I am sharing the screen with my guide, my teacher, my mentor, Dr. R.V. Subramaniam sir, fondly called as Subra sir by everyone. And uh, I'm also sharing the screen with one of my most dear colleague and ma'am, uh, uh, Dr. Mandana ma'am. Uh, so two beautiful uh, persons in my life. Uh, and uh, without much time, uh, may I now introduce my teacher? It's been a, a privilege and honor to introduce my teacher, my guide, my mentor, uh, Dr. R. V. Subramaniam, sir, uh, Professor Venkata Subramaniam, sir. So, sir has completed his BDS from Rajamutaya Dental College and Hospital, Annamalai University, Chidambaram, and MDS from Naya Dental College and Hospital, Mumbai. Sir is a dedicated academician with over 30 years of teaching experience, with eight years as principal and three years as director of PG studies. Most recently, he was working as professor at King Faisal University College of Dentistry, Saudi Arabia, and has just returned to India after six years. Sir has uh, numerous publications and captivated many professional gatherings with his guest lectures which would uh, include his uh, cartoons and sir has a great sense of humor he's a recognized phd guide by dr ntr university of health sciences Andhra pradesh india and a member of editorial board of highly reputed international journal of translational medicine he was a past editor of Journal of Oral and Maxillofacial Pathology, the official journal of the Indian Association of Oral Pathologists. Sir has also been a resource person for training the teachers program by Dr. NTR University of Health Sciences, Vijayawada. Sir is a very passionate teacher and he loves teaching and technology. He is very well versed with modern teaching methodologies, very adept at using advanced online teaching uh, platforms. We as first batch of PG students under sir, myself, Dr. Madhushankari and Dr. Prahalad 
were fortunate to have witnessed the modern technology way back in 1999 to 2000 and his contribution in streamlining uh, the teaching and evaluation are well known and appreciated by not only his students but colleagues around the world as well as abroad so sir without much delay now i hand over the stage to our favorite supra sir and happy teachers day sir and what a oh, thank you. measurable moment for me that uh, this week is happy teachers day and i'm uh, uh, i have privilege to introduce my teacher thank you so much for this opportunity madam welcome sir and you're thank most you. welcome now we shall let's uh, begin i think I should share my screen now. Yes, please. Yes, sir. Can you all hear me? Ah, uh, yes, sir. We can hear you. Oh, good morning, everyone. First and foremost, let me thank Dr. Mandala for inviting me on this forum. Um, it's really nice to have a special separate forum for oral pathology and having eminent speakers to come and speak on this particular forum. Thank you so much, madam. And yes, uh, it's really nice uh, to have my first PG student, uh, Dr. Nandini, hello, Mr. Professor, now uh, introducing me. Thank you so much, Nandini, for such a a wonderful introduction. Uh, you know, I always keep hoping that uh, whenever uh, you know, such introductions are given, my wife is around, you know, so that uh, you know, she realizes uh, what a wonderful person I am. Unfortunately, she's not there now. <laughs> Maybe I think I'll make her I'll listen to the recorded uh, version of this presentation. Um, Landini was telling you, know, like, uh, I have a great sense of humor. I love cartoons. I love cartooning. So I thought I should begin with a cartoon. Uh, where you can see a guy is introducing his dog and he has called this dog as Achilles. No? And he says, Achilles heel. And the friend notices and says, oh, he didn't even do it. Seriously. No? So he says, that is his weakness. Okay, The name of the dog is Achilles. And the weakness is that it is not able to heal. Okay, So I think all of you are familiar with this word, Achilles heel, which is supposed to be a weak point. Okay, so if you look at the origin of this word Achilles, okay, or Achilles heel, uh, Achilles, when he was a baby, his mother Thetis, uh, she dipped him in uh, river, uh, river sticks. Okay, the uh, reason was if a, a person is dipped in that river, they become ill, vulnerable to diseases or any kind of attack. Okay, so she was holding the baby on his heel and she dipped him in the river. So the whole body was dipped except for the heel. And that was the vulnerable point of Achilles. And when Paris shot an arrow during the Trojan War, he aimed at the heel and that resulted in death of Achilles. Okay, So that is the reason why the term Achilles heel. And in fact, uh, it's still used as one of the most uh, vulnerable parts of the leg, you know, Achilles heel. Later on, uh, a Dutch anatomist, uh, Philip Verheyen, he was the one who used this term Achilles heel to tell that it's a very vulnerable area of the leg. So with that small introduction, I'm going to speak on etymology of oral lesions. I shall tell the objectives of my presentation. I shall talk about some basic elements, not the entire, some basic elements of a word, nomenclature of oral diseases, and just an outline, etymology of oral lesions, eponyms, toponyms, acronyms and abbreviations, metaphors and similes, foreign phrases, and misnomers in oral pathology. And before I start my presentation, I would like to make this disclaimer that I'm not an authority on Latin, Greek, or ancient French scholarship. Okay. This presentation does not include all oral lesions. Uh, all of you are able to hear me? Because uh, there has been a current... Yes, uh, yeah, yes. okay. I just yes, want to make sure that... Yeah, okay. 
so thankfully i have a you know uh power supply even for the wifi so it should not be a problem my interest in this uh, words and the word origins is because of my very good friend rajiv desai uh, way back in 1990s you know he had uh, introduced me to an article he gave me an article you know in fact a photocopy of it on medical misnomers so this was the one which picked my interest in I mean, not only misnomers but the origin of words what we call it as etymology okay and that is uh, when when i started looking at origins of all the words which i used to come across not only words which are related to uh, oral pathology but also you know words generally which we use in english even various phrases you know uh, which we use in english i started getting interested and trying to find out the origin of these phrases so i thank uh, no rajiv desai for uh, stimulating that interest in me so let us start with the french poet felix qui potiut rarum cognosia causas so what does this mean it means fortunate for those who are able to know the causes of things so not only the origin of words but cause of anything if you are able to know about it it makes us understand it better so this in fact has been uh, used quotation quite often in one of uh, the asterix comic okay it's one of my favorite comic characters asterix and obelix so asterix and obelix and see has got this particular quote you know felix qui potut rerum cognos your causes fortunate or those who are able to know the causes of things basically if you look at all the english words okay the origin of english words uh, they can be from uh, middle english or germanic french latin these are the three main languages from where most of the english words are derived but they can also be derived from other languages but when you look at the medical words and dental words most of them have their origin either from latin or greek greek more often than latin in fact many of the uh, latin words in fact are derived from greek okay um when you look at english english is considered to be an incomplete language whereas latin and greek are considered to be complete languages what do you mean by that basically english is not complete even though no lot of words are being added to english so it is not complete whereas latin and greek are composed and it's considered to be a complete language in other sense i mean like no new words are being added okay like more recently for example uh, ayo has been added in english which is an indian word <laughs> very often which we use has been recently added to english dictionary so we don't have like that words being added to latin or greek okay they are considered to be complete languages and most of the words which we use either in medicine or in dentistry have their origin from latin or greek and that's why probably these subjects are like latin and greek to us so this particular person wanted to become somebody who studies the origin of words and he got confused and he ended up in this profession can you guess the profession he became an entomologist very often entomologist is confused with etymologist entomology etymology entomology you know if you look at the etymology of entomology okay it means study of insects okay so let us not get confused entomology with etymology and let's just look at etymology of etymology okay so etymology if you see it is derived from a greek word etymos and another greek word logo etymos means something which is true the origin true origin of something and logos means study okay so basically that has resulted in the greek word etymology from where latin word etymologia and the old french word etymology and finally english we have the word etymology which is nothing but study of origin of words so if you look at the basic elements of a medical or any dental word 
they have a root word, which is the basic form, okay, from uh, which is responsible for the final word, okay. So each word should have at least one root word. Maybe exceptions are a and or the. Except for that, few words. Most of the roots will have at least one root word, and then we have a compiling letter. Usually, this compiling letter is O or I, and then we have a prefix or a suffix. If prefix is added before the word, may be added. Not always. All the words have prefix, so they appear at the beginning of the word, okay? and they describe you know, how, why, where, how much, position, direction, hmm, or status of the root word, and suffix. End and which appear at the end of the word, they are responsible for telling about a condition or a disease or a procedure. Like for example, itis at the end of the word would mean inflammation. For example, pulpitis. Similarly, a word like pre in front of another word, you know, use the inform. I mean, like word, uh, like for example, pre means before. Like example is prenatal, you no know, before birth. So the problem, no, is that. Whenever we come across the word pre in front, we think that it is a prefix. There are some words which where we have pre in front, but not a prefix. Very uh, common uh, uh, error which we all make is postponed. You know? So this lecture has been postponed. So if you want to say that this lecture has been advanced, people say this lecture has been preponed. Very few people, I think, are aware of the fact that there is no word called as preponed. Okay. It's not postponed, and therefore we have pre-pone. Okay, so postpone is one word. It is not post and pone. Okay, so there are a few words like this you know, where pre in front of a word or apparent word does not mean a prefix. So some examples are given you here. Like for example, if you consider the root word luco. Okay, so luke means white. If you add a prefix to it, pre and a suffix plakia. And we use the combining letter O. Okay, so luco plakia is a white patch. Look for white plakia for patch with the combining letter O. If you add a pre in front, it becomes pre luco plakia, something which occurs before the actual luco plakia is. As I told you, most of the words should have at least one root word. But there are locations where you can have two root words, like here electro cardio. Okay, so we have two root words, and of course the suffix here is a gram, and the word is electrocardiogram. Most often, the combining letter is O. Occasionally, we can have I as a combining letter. Example, lithiasis has got I as a combining letter, and not all words will have a combining letter. There are some instances where we don't use a combining letter. So the cardinal rule is that if the root word starts with a vowel, like for example here, emia, okay? So then there is no combining letter required. For example, anemia, we don't have anomia or an e -M -I -M -E, no? emia, okay? So that is the cardinal rule regarding the basic elements of a word. So this is uh, something which I came across online and I liked it. Polyamory is wrong. It's either multi-amory or polyphilia. So mixing different languages, the roots of different languages can lead to confusion. You know, for example, here, like polyamory, if you see, poly is a Greek word, amory for amorous, okay, is a Latin word. So they mix both Latin and uh, Greek words. Okay, so they say either it should be polyphilia, philian, philian to love in Greek, or multiamory, which is multi, is Latin, amory, amorous for love. Okay, so multi-amory means having multiple loves or polyphilia, the same thing in Greek. So it is mixing of the two different languages, roots of two different languages. Coming to oral pathology, if you look at this particular word, amyloblast, which all of you are familiar with. So if you look at the Greek origin of it, it means A plus melos plus blastos. That means melos is for limb, blastos means sprout. Okay, that's something which is sprouting. Okay, like a formative cell. So amyloblast, according to Greek, means a cell without a limb. The same word, if you look at Latin origin, okay, it means ant plus milior 
for that amylo part. And of course, the blast is the cell part. Okay, so add milieu means which is making something better. But the actual meaning of ameloblast, if you see, it is amylo plus blastos. Amylo is derived from Anglo French for enamelailer. So, enamelailer is an Anglo French word which is basically derived from a German word, smelzain. Okay, smelzain was uh, the meaning of, you know, smelzain is that smelting. Right? Like smelting, you know, like, like molten you know, um, uh, metal is glazed over surfaces. So since enamel has got that kind of uh, you know, glazed surface on the crown of the tooth, okay, this word was used for enamel. So enamel is not, of course, contained only to teeth. We have enamel paints. Okay? So the reason why the term enamel came into existence was because of you know, the German origin, smelzain. Okay, from the word smelzain or smelting, you know, the Anglo-French word enameler was introduced. And from there, amylo for enamel. So the term ameloblast is a combination of two words, Anglo-French and <coughs> the Greek word. Excuse me. Okay. So even though look, very often you'll come across these kind of words where there is combination of two different languages. Okay. But to avoid confusion, it's better to avoid mixing of two different languages, especially roots of two different languages. Now, let us look at the nomenclature. Well, if you split the word nomenclature, again, you know, it can be uh, misunderstood as nomenclature or nomenculture. Okay? Of course, that is not the meaning of nomenclature. Okay? Uh, so, I've got back the you know, electricity here. Okay? So, that's why my face has suddenly become bright. Okay? Uh, not because you know, what a some divine uh, intervention that my face has become bright. <laughs> anyway, uh, coming back to the etymology of nomenclature, it's derived from Latin, nomen plus calere. Nomen for name, calere means to call. So basically it means nomenclature, it means calling names. Okay. So when we start calling others' names, no. so that is also a type of nomenclature. Okay. But here, uh, nomenclature is basically about naming. Okay. And basically about classifying. Okay. So that is the origin of this word nomenclature. If you look at the nomenclature of oral diseases, they can be based on etiology, like for example, aspirin burns or candidiasis. They can be based on morphology. Morphology means study of shape. Etiology means study of origin of anything, okay, of causes, that is etiology. Morphology, study of shapes. So basically, based on the shape of the lesion, we can call it as no, appearance of the lesion as like example, anodontia, irritum. Based on the location, we can classify them as gingivitis, ulpitis. Based on pathogenesis, we can normally you know, give the name, like for example, amylogenesis imperfecta. So when you uh, look at the word, you'll be able to understand what is it all about. Amylogenesis, that means you know, the formation of enamel, imperfecta is not perfect. Or the nomenclature of a disease can be based on its pathology. Like for example, fibrosarcoma. The moment you read that word, you know, okay, fibrosarcoma is a malignant tumor involving fibers, fibroblasts, okay? Or it can be based on eponyms. Or it can be based on eponyms. Eponyms means based on individuals who have first observed it or who have suffered from it. Or it can be based on toponyms. Toponyms is based on a particular area, geographical location, like for example, Lyme disease. Okay. So let us start with uh, oral lesion, you know, a dental condition, which is very common all over the world, caries. Okay. So if uh, all of us know, or probably most of us are aware that caries means a rotten tooth. Okay. Most of us are probably aware that caries means a rotten tooth. And we keep on calling us dental caries. But the origin of the word caries you know, is either from Latin or Greek. From Greek, word care, which means death, destruction. Or from the Latin word kerio, which means lack of something, lacking something. Just lacking something. 
one minute. Sorry, you know, because of um, so. If you look at the word uh, "caries," which means rotten, okay, the Latin word "cario" means lacking something. So when uh, you see the origin, it means probably because the tooth is deficient. Okay, the word "cario" also means deficient. So that's why from there the word you know, which we use "caries" is defined. I mean, de deficient in something and therefore rotting. So that is why the word "caries." No, as spawned, and that is how the English word caries. So, what we need to understand is the word caries is not uh, limited to dentistry. We also have something called as bone caries. In uh, general pathology, caries sicca is quite a common word. Caries, you no, know, sicca means sicca means dry. Okay, so this is also called as bone caries. So, that's the reason why we need to probably specify in dentistry as dental caries because we have something called as bone caries also. And this caries sicca or bone caries can especially seen in um, or syphilis you know, or tuberculosis. Talking about syphilis, Osler once stated that physician who knows syphilis knows medicine. Okay, probably you know a disease which has got maximum number of synonyms is syphilis. It's also called as great pox to differentiate from small pox, French disease, French pox, leus. Lose venerea, ladies' fever, French gout, Neapolitan disease, Spanish disease in Netherlands, Polish disease in Russia, Chinese disease in Japan, Canton disease in China, Christian disease in Turkey, and probably a lot more. Okay. Um, if you look at the history of syphilis, you no, know, the reason why it's called as French disease is, um, I mean, like there's a story behind it. They feel that you know, this disease started you know, when there was a war going on between the Neapolitans and the French. So the Neapolitans apparently sent a lot of prostitutes to you know, France who were infected with this disease to infect all the soldiers so that they can you know, have an advantage over the French in the war. Okay, uh, But they say uh, this uh, disease syphilis you know, has uh, a relationship with Christopher Columbus who went around the world and came back to Europe and was responsible. You know, maybe he and his sailors were responsible for spreading syphilis in Europe. If you look at one of the uh, terms which is used for syphilis is use venerea. In fact, before syphilis became popular as a term, the term which was used was use venerea. The term use is derived from Greek, which means filth. From there, the Latin word luo for wash and loose in Latin, which means plague, and in the English word loose. Okay. The pronunciation was uh, no, loose, uh, probably it means that people who behave in a very loose manner end up with loose. The other word venereal surprisingly has got origin from a Sanskrit word vanas, vanas, which means desire. Okay. So probably. This word is responsible for the Latin word Venus, and from there the word venereus and the English word venereal. Okay, so probably because Venus, you know, uh, is considered to be the goddess of, you know, desire. Okay, so probably the term venereal has been used because syphilis is most often because of you know, transmitted because of sexual desires. So that is the reason why the term use venereal. But the term syphilis is because of this person, Girolamo Fracastoro. Okay. He was the one who wrote this book, Syphilis Sive Morbus Gallicus, in 1530, which translated as syphilis or the French disease. Okay. So he was the one who gave the name syphilis indirectly because he, in the book which he had uh, written, you know, there was a poem where a shepherd, Syphilius, Okay, syphilis, you can see him drinking, you know, water here. Okay, so he apparently insulted uh, the god Apollo. Okay, and Apollo got uh, insulted and he you know, sort of uh, gave you know, this kind of a pestilence, a plague you know, for him to suffer. Okay, and he also told you know, that uh, 
once if a person yields to temptation, is likely to end up with this kind of a disease. Okay, so the term syphilis is because of this shepherd in that poem, syphilis, later on which became syphilis, and that is how the word syphilis you know, came for this particular disease, and it has continued, you know, and probably quite popular when compared to the other terms. And syphilis reminds about uh, one of the lesions which we see in secondary syphilis, condyloma later. So if you look at this word condyloma later, it is derived from two words, condyle and later. This word condyle is derived from the Greek word condylus, which means knuckle. Okay? So that is how even, for example, the condyle of the mandible, okay, you know, resembles a knuckle. Okay, or a knob, door knob, like how you see here. Okay, and that's the reason why the term condyle. Later is not because it's uh, you no know, elision which occurs quite late. No, it is probably derived from either Latins or later. Both are uh, you no, know, or Latin words. Okay, um, where probably because of the fact that condyle motor later lesions are broad, moist lesions, okay? The word latus is responsible for calling it as condylometa later, okay? And of course, we are talking about condyle. We also know that in syphilis, there's one more lesion which is quite popular, okay? That is shanker. Now, shanker, canker, cancer. All these three words are similar. And all the three words have the same origin. Okay. All the three words have the same origin. Basically, it is derived from Proto Indo European root, which means hard, air. And from that word, the Greek word karkainos, which means uh, crab, or from the Sanskrit word karkata, like I think those who are familiar with uh, the Indian uh, zodiac signs, karkata rasi, which means uh, cancer. Okay, so Karkata is again probably derived from the same proto Indian root hard. And in fact, uh, when Hippocrates uh, also called the lesion cancer as cancer, he was basing it on the Greek word Karkanos for cancer. So, probably because of the fact that it has got so many you know, spreading uh, legs. Okay, so he felt you know, it spreads you know, in various uh, directions. And it resembled, when he looks at the lesion, it resembled like a crab. So that's why he used the word carpenos. You know? And that has given rise to the Latin word crab or cancer. And this old English cancer has given rise to English cancer. And in old North French, as canker, it's become canker. And the old French word, which is used as shanker. Cancer, as to the all of you know, it means carcinoma. Canker is what we see in case of abscess ulcer. Shanker is the primary lesion which we see in syphilis. Okay, in, in, uh, the lesion which you see in primary syphilis. Okay, so all these three words are basically of the same origin, especially because of the fact that any ulcer which was observed, you know, quite long ago, they used to call it as cancer. Of course, then later on they could uh, differentiate. So when you look at the word shanker, okay. Uh, two individuals are responsible uh, for this word. One is John Hunter, other is Philip Record. Okay? So that's why sometimes it's called as Hunterian Shanker or Records Shanker. Okay? In case of Scottish surgeon uh, John Hunter, apparently you know, uh, he inoculated himself okay, with uh, the infection. You know, he was working on patients with gonorrhea. So he said, you know, I will inoculate. You know, the organism in uh, cell, and then I'll see what will happen. So, unfortunately for him, you know, the patient also was suffering from syphilis, which he was not aware of, and happened to get you know, the lesion, you know, which uh, he got it from the patient. And when he described it later on, it has become eponym, uh, uh, Hunterian shank. Philip Record had done a lot of studies you know, on the primary uh, syphilis and the lesions and especially in the French uh, Parisian prostitutes. And that is why he came across the ulcer, shanker, 
and that's why it's also called as Rickard's canker. When it comes to canker, okay, the reason why it's called as canker or canker sore, abscess ulcer, is because of the fact that it resembles either in plants or these flowers. Okay, of course, there's a kind of a wild rose which is affected in case if it's affected by a canker worm, it has similar lesions like what we see in case of abscess ulcer. Or in case of citrus canker, the citrus fruits have this you know, small areas of uh, destruction which resembles the lesions which are seen in abscess ulcer. So that is the reason why these are called as canker sores. Okay, so because of the resemblance to these lesions, especially those which you see in the plants. As I told you earlier, canker sore is also called as abscess ulcer. So if you look at the origin of the word abscess is derived from the Greek word apta. Apta was a very old term used by Hippocrates for oral thrush. Okay. So, but of course, now we know that these two are not related. Okay. So, but the actual meaning of abscess is, you know, was the one which was introduced by Hippocrates, after, which means oral thrush. So that, uh, that remains as of uh, you know, oral thrush and how what is the origin? Probably most of you are familiar with this particular term, oral thrush. And we know that it's a scandidiasis, acute pseudomemory scandidiasis. And the reason why it is called as oral thrush is because of the fact that it resembles, and you see here, the chest of this bird thrush, okay, and since it occurs in the, occurs in the oral cavity, you know, it, can, uh, it has been called as oral thrush because of the curdy white appearance of the chest or the breast of this bird thrush. So that's why it's called as oral thrush. So this is about oral thrush, a bird, and I think all of you are aware of uh, coronoid process, okay, just one second. Coronoid process, you know, mistakenly might be thought that you know, probably because you know, it is resembling a you know, crown, like how we have corona means crown. You know? So that's why it's called as coronoid process. But actually, coronoid process is not related to crown at all. It is related to the bird raven or a crow, corax, which is for raven or a crow. Okay. And from this word corax, the word coronoid is derived. The reason is this coronoid process, okay, resembles the beak of a crow or a raven, okay, the curved beak of a crow or a raven. So that's the reason why it is called as coronoid process. And um, since we already learned about what is the origin of condyle, what is the origin of coronoid, so we should also look at the origin of the word mandible, okay. So basically, Mandible is derived from Latin, mando to chew, and bula means the suffix bula for instrument. So mandibula means a chewing instrument, okay, or instrument which helps in chewing. So there is a word mandible came into existence. So it's not only birds which are there, uh, you know, which are responsible for some birds which we see, even animals are included. So scrofula, if you see, well, which is a manifestation of tuberculosis. Okay, so if there's a swelling in the cervical portion, you know, cervical lymph nodes when they are affected, well, it usually becomes quite big, and apparently it uh, resembles uh, so. Okay, especially a so which is pregnant. Okay, so because it resembles a so, the word scrofula is used, which means a so. Okay, uh, pregnant so. So that is the origin of the word scrofula. And the picture which is uh, there on the screen shows you know, like one of the stories which are related to tuberculosis, okay, so where apparently the, if the king, okay, touched the patients who are suffering from tuberculosis, they became all right. So that's why it's also called as king's evil, okay, because only the king, when they touch, you know, the patient can get rid of the evil. Another animal which uh, we are very familiar with in oral pathology is wolf. Okay. So the word for wolf etymologically is lupus. So we have a good number of birds 
which are related to lupus. Like in case of uh, tuberculosis, we have lupus vulgaris. Then we have lupus erythematosus, lupus profundus, lupus paniculitis, lupus perineum. Okay. In fact, uh, paniculitis, profundus, they're all probably related to erythematosus. But lupus perineum is seen in sarcoidosis. Lupus vulgaris is a skin manifestation which you see in case of tuberculosis. Of course, the term vulgaris makes us remember of another disease, pemphigus vulgaris. Okay. Um, vulgaris is nothing to do with vulgar. Okay. Of course, when you use the term vulgar now, it means something very bad. You know? If you use bad words, he is using vulgar words. But actually, the term vulgar or vulgaris means common. Okay. So, of all the different varieties of pemphigus, pemphigus uh, of this variety is more common than the others. So that's why it's called as pemphigus vulgaris, no? not because it is seen in individuals who have vulgar behavior. Okay. So the term pemphigus is derived from Greek pemphix, which means you no know, uh, to breathe or air. You know? Basically, it's like a bubble. Okay? So because it's a blister, blistering disease, the word pemphigus is used for these lesions. Okay. And we all know that pemphigus, you no, know, if you we happen to have an unruptured no, bull or, or a vesicle. When you rupture it, okay, we can you know, get those acanthalytic cells, spread it on a slide, and have a look. So that you know, is um, the Zang test. Okay. Of course, the term pemphigot is just to say that it resembles pemphigus, therefore the suffix oid. So pemphigus reminds us of Zang cells and Zang test, and this is an eponymous disease where is named after this individual, no, Zhang, okay, who was responsible for you know, doing this kind of a test, the Zhang test, you know, where he had ruptured the vesicle, spread it on a slide. A French uh, uh, pathologist was responsible for introducing this test for us to diagnose these kind of vesicular bullous lesions. So that makes us come to eponymous lesions. Uh, just now I mentioned about Zank test or Zank uh, cells. Okay, so that is an eponym. So what is an eponym? So basically this is derived from Greek, epi and onima. Okay, epi means upon or named after something. And onima means name. Okay, so epi means upon, like epithelia. Okay, it's, telia means a nipple. Epithelia means above a nipple. Okay, so epi, Onaima gave rise to the term eponym. So these eponyms I have classified into four based on a person who have discovered it, based on persons who have suffered from it, based on a location where it was observed, and based on a society where it was seen. Okay. So let us just see a few examples of these eponyms. Okay, there's a big list of eponyms. Uh, those who are really interested in knowing about eponyms, there is a Series of articles by Scully, Marathon of Eponyms in Oral Diseases Journal, uh, 2000, sorry, it is uh, uh, typing error there, 2011 and 2012. Okay, 2011 and 12 in Oral Diseases Journal, uh, there was a series of articles, Marathon of Eponyms. So those who are interested probably can refer to those articles. I've just listed out a few of these eponyms, which could be lesions, tests, or even signs. So eponyms named out of person, I think all of you are familiar with Page's disease. Okay. So Page's disease of the skin, Page's disease of the bone, Page's disease of the breast. Okay, and there's some people say also Page's sign. Okay, so it's named after Sir James Page. Okay. So in fact, uh, there were a lot of uh, you know, stories that Page's himself or, you know, suffered from that disease, Page's disease of the bone, but that is not true. Another example of being named after a person is gram stain, which all of you are familiar with. But uh, the reason why I'm showing uh, this particular uh, uh, gram stain under eponymous lesions is that, uh, I mean, sorry, eponymous words is that they say gram stain <coughs> was an accidental discovery. No, apparently, you know, oh, when he was working on slides, you no, know, uh, the iodine bottle spilt over one of the slides and that is how he came across you know, this gram staining method. 
Okay, so this kind of accidental discoveries are called as serendipitous, serendipitous discoveries, uh, accidental Shita? discoveries. Yes. Hello. Sita. Uh, actually, uh, Tanya had sent her uh, research assistant to ask whether she can send the biopsies. She, uh, she has collected around twelve and samples. And Nandini, your voice is on. Okay, so no problem. No problem. Uh, <laughs> just give me a small time. break too. It no? gives you a break. That's we have to um, water. <laughs> our uh, trial and error first. So oh, uh, you, you okay. saw that uh, stain. अच्छा है. अच्छा है. Nandini. <laughs> okay. So that is how the term ants uh, I mean, gram stain. Okay, apparently a uh, accidental discovery. That is ready-made only they are using. Today why don't? Okay. Now eponyms. Yes, go on. Go on. Very very few eponyms are there, and surprisingly named after a person who has suffered from it. Okay, a very good example is uh, Christmas disease. Okay, it is not because it is seen during Christmas season. It is named after a patient, Stephen Christmas, a five-year-old boy who suffered from it. Okay, so that's why it's called as Christmas disease because of deficiency of Christmas factors. Of course, that factor also has been named after the, the patient. There, are, but not too many examples are there. Another example is Lou Gehrig's uh, disease, which is you know, actually named after this person who is a very famous basketball player. Uh, another famous person who suffered from it, I think, is Stephen Hawking, who suffered from this. Eponyms that have been retracted. See, there are some uh, words which, uh, you know, like vaginal granulomatis, which was quite popular you know, and was also you know, quite a preferable term for quite some time. But now the preferred term is granulomatosis with polyangiitis. The reason is apparently this um, fetish vaginal, uh, a German uh, pathologist. Probably had links with Nazi regime, and also probably involved with certain war crimes. So they felt no, it is not right to honor him uh, being uh, by naming a disease after him. So that's why they have retracted the term vaginal granulomatosis, and now the preferred term is granulomatosis with polyangiitis. Uh, another person who has similar links with Nazi uh, is Reiter's syndrome, which is probably now a uh, preferred term is reactive arthritis rather than. A writer's syndrome, probably because of their uh, background. There's something called as toponyms. Topo means let me know it's all related to geography, okay, location. So a good number of toponyms are there, like Brandywine type of dentinogenesis imperfecta. So during my college days, I used to think that Brandywine means you know, probably that variety of dentinogenesis imperfecta resembles brandy or wine. That's why it's called as Brandywine. Dentinogenesis imperfecta. In fact, I had a doubt at that time when it is resembling wine. Is it red wine or white wine? No, probably white wine because uh, no, it's uh, penciling the teeth. But of course, brandy wine is a place in uh, Maryland. Okay, because of uh, the cases which have been described there, it has been called as brandy wine type of dentinogenesis imperfecta. Another popular one is coast of Maine appearance, which we see in fibrous dysplasia. No, here the cafe lock. Spots which you see, you know, probably because they have jagged edges, okay, resembling the coast of Maine. So it has been called as coast of Maine appearance in, uh, of appearance of the pigmented lesions in McEwen Albright syndrome. Of course, McEwen Albright syndrome is again an example of Nippon. So let us also look at uh, abbreviations, acronyms, and initialisms. You know, I'll just give only a or uh, passing uh, comment about these. Abbreviations means basically a shortened word or a phrase. Acronyms and initialisms are also a type of abbreviation. But generally when you say abbreviation, you are not creating a new word. You're just, <coughs> excuse me. Sorry. Basically you're just shortening a word or a phrase. You're not creating a new word. Like for example, photo instead of photograph. ETZ, you know, for etc. like that. Whereas acronyms, we usually take the first letter of words and form a new pronounceable word, like example, laser, right? Amplification by stimulated emission of radiation. Okay. Radar is another good example of acronyms. AIDS is a good example of acronym. Okay. Initialism 
is when you are just taking the first letter, but you are not forming a word out of it. Like for example, VIP, ATM, DNA, RNA. Okay. So that is called as initialism. So we have good number of lesions like that, you know, which are you know, either acronyms or initialisms, like AIDS, SIDS, TAXA. Okay. And examples of English like EMJ, SLE, EBV, RNA, DNA, like that. Okay. So probably there are very a uh, long list of these abbreviations, acronyms, and initialisms in dentistry and oral pathology. Uh, I also would like to say a few words about these metaphors and simile. What is a simile? Simile, a simile is saying something is like something else. Okay, similar. Simile, something is like something else. So use usually the term as in the not double list, single list. Like for example, blind as a bat. Okay, that's a simile. Whereas a metaphor is saying something is something, like time is money. Okay, where actually, no, you cannot, it is not literally speaking, but figuratively speaking. Okay, so that is a metaphor. Okay. So we also have uh, examples of these metaphors and similes in oral pathology, like black hairy tongue, butterfly rash, geographic tongue, you know, raspberry tongue, serpentine nuclei, strawberry tongue, Swiss cheese appearance in syndrome. You know, like that. And here, of course, Swiss cheese itself is a metaphor, and cylindroma is also a metaphor, you know, because of its resemblance to cylinders. Okay. Similes and metaphors are same. Only thing is when you start describing it, okay, as something, then it becomes a simile. Like cottage cheese appearance of the tongue in oral thrush, aspiration, which is cheesy in case of odontogenic characteristics. Cauliflower like appearance of papilloma or varicose carcinoma. So these are examples of similes. A very good number of similes are there in radiographs, you know, radiographic similes like branchless, fruit laden leaf, cotton wool appearance, hair on end appearance, honeycomb appearance, moth eaten appearance, onion peel appearance, salt and pepper appearance. So these are good examples of similes in oral pathology. Oh, a nice example of these uh, similes and metaphors is chickenpox and herpes zoster. Chickenpox is not called chickenpox because of relation to chickens, okay? Because of its resemblance to chickpea, the lesions, you know, they uh, resemble chickpea, okay? That's the reason why it is called as chickenpox. Of course, pox from English, believe English word pox, and chiche for chick, okay? So it's for chickpea, so that is how the term chickenpox. Similarly, herpes zoster, the reason why it's called herpes means creeping, creeping lesions, okay? The term zoster, which is also called as, you know, herpes zoster also called as shingles. The reason is both zoster and shingles mean girdle or waist belt. Shingles is derived from singulus, in which in Latin means a girdle, okay? And Greek zoster means a waist belt. The, Lesions, herpes zoster, you know, very often they are seen in the waist. Okay, so that is the reason why it is called as shingles or waist um, zoster. <clears throat> in fact, if you look at our anterior teeth, you know, they have cingulum. Okay, so again, the reason why is probably you know it's present at the uh, point between the crown and the root of the tooth. Okay, at the waist area. So that's why we, probably the term cingulum is given for that particular anatomic location. So looking at all these phrases, no, there are quite a lot of foreign phrases in oral pathology, direct foreign phrases I'm talking about. I'm not talking about uh, words which are derived from foreign phrases, like cafe or lait, updrop fung, which is something you know you must have heard about when you're talking about devices, like uh, dropping off effect, like updrop fung, carcinoma in situ, kudi saber, de novo, perleche, in vitro, in vivo, tic dulero, you know, which is a French word, which means you know, itching tricks, ticks, you know, means spasms, like tick, okay, and <clears throat> which are painful. So that's why tic dulero, okay. That's a French word for uh, painful spasms or twitching spasms. The reason why I have highlighted carcinoma and situ is that carcinoma and situ is a, you know, a problematic term because it's also called as intra epithelial carcinoma, okay. So it uh, may not be a correct term because you know, when you say intra-epithelial carcinoma, that means carcinoma within the epithelium. So, which is not correct. You know? Because when you say carcinoma, it means that it has broken away the basement membrane of the epithelium and it has 
entered into the connective tissue. Then only you call it as carcinoma. So if it's within the epithelium, how can it be carcinoma? So the term intra-epithelial carcinoma is not correct. And that takes us to what are called as misnomers. Okay? So the next part of our presentation is going to be about misnomers. The term misnomers, here again we have combination of two groups of two different languages, mis and nominee. Okay. So mis means something which is not correct. Okay. And nominee means name. Okay. So that have resulted in the word misnomer or in old French or old Norman and the English word misnomer. Okay. So misnomer means a wrong application of terms. Okay. So we are, uh, can classify misnomers as follows probably because of etymological misinterpretations, because of misunderstanding and misconceptions, because of misapplication of terms, which could be confusing, or eponymous type of misnomers. Okay. Like, let us look at them one by one. Misnomers because of etymological misinterpretations. I'm not going to talk about all of these. Okay. Um, I should just ignore a few of these examples, like we have Jensen, then Aertrogenic, uh, or iatrogenic, odontogenic, amyloblast, ankyloglossia, eosinophilic granuloma, dilaceration, and so forth. Um, one of the most interesting terms is iatrogenic. So when we use the suffix genic, which means we should be producing, like when I say fibrogenic, means capable of producing fibers. When I say chondrogenic, capable of producing cartilage. Osteogenic, producing bone. So iatros means physician. So the term iatrogenic would be producing a physician. But we use the term iatrogenic for stating that it has been produced by a physician. Okay. But if you look at the word iatrogenic, genau means to produce, iatros means physician. So iatrogenic means producing a physician. In a similar fashion, if you look at the term odontogenic, orendos, okay, or odias is the Greek origin for orento which means tooth, and again, genau means to produce. So orontogenic means producing a tooth. So a orontogenic tumor is a tumor which produces tooth. So if amyloblastoma is an orontogenic tumor, then amyloblastoma should be producing a tooth. Okay. So except for a few orontogenic tumors which are actually capable of producing tooth-like structures, most of the orontogenic tumors are not truly speaking orontogenic tumors. So the term orontogenic is again a misnomer. Misnomers because of erroneous concepts. Good number of examples are there, like for example, amyloblastoma, aneurysmal bone cyst. I already mentioned about carcinoma in situ and intra epithelial carcinoma, fibroma, fibromatosis, hemangioma, melanocanthoma, and melanoma, odentoma, pyogenic granuloma. Like for example, aneurysmal bone cyst, there's no aneurysm. Fibroma is not a true neoplasm. Hemangioma is also not a true neoplasm, it is a hematoma. Odentoma, Again, a hematoma. Pyogenic granuloma is neither pyogenic nor a granuloma. It's a granulation tissue and does not produce pus. So it's neither pyogenic nor a granuloma. Okay. So let us look at amyloblastoma. Amyloblastoma, if you look at the cells, they are not, which is mean in amyloblastoma, are not true amyloblasts. They are pre amyloblasts. Okay. So in a lot of studies have been done where they could differentiate and say that what we see. In case of these amyloblast tumors, they are not true amyloblasts, they are pre amyloblasts. Okay, so then the tumor should probably be called as pre amyloblastoma. But if you use the term pre amyloblastoma, again, it might be confusing that it is a tumor which is just before actual amyloblastoma can form. Okay, so that is because of the fact, but I think it's been convenient to use the term amyloblastoma. So we have been continuing to use the term amyloblastoma, though the cells which we see, uh, sorry, see in case of amyloblastoma are not actually amyloblasts, but pre-amyloblasts. Misnomers because of this application of terms. Good number of examples are there. Actinomycosis, egg granulocytosis, leukedema, mycosis fungoids, oral submicros fibrosis, schwannoma, pleomorphic adenoma, and so forth. Like for example, A granulocytosis, if you see, you know, is it A granulocytosis or is it A granulocytosis? 
Okay, so quite confusing because when you say granulocyte process, it means we are talking about granulocytes. So a granulocyte process would mean the lack of a granulocytes. But when you say a granulocytosis, it means that it is increase in number of cells of a granular cells. Okay, so in that way, you know, it could be quite confusing. Look at actinomycosis, for example. Okay, the reason why it is called as actinomycosis, okay, is because of the fact that initially it was named as Stralenpilz, which means radiating fungus. Okay, by Bollinger of Munich in 1877. Okay, so from that they decided that okay, this is a fungal organism, and that is how they have given the Greek word as actus for ray. Okay. Mucus for fungus and osis for condition. So we have got actinomycosis. Okay. But actinomycosis, we all know, is a bacterial infection, not a fungal infection. Okay. So in that way, it is you know, probably misapplication of terms. Similarly, candidiasis or candidosis. Again, this is a question of application of terms because if you look at the suffix iasis, generally we use it for. Uh, Prostosial lesions, okay, like leishmaniasis, filariasis, trypanosomiasis, okay. But for all fungal infections, we use the suffix osis, histoplasmosis, blastomycosis, like that. So, if you say strictly speaking, candidosis is the right term for the fungal infection causing or caused by candida rather than candidiasis, because it might give an impression that it is a protozoal infection. But however, both are being used you know, simultaneously, synonymously, so it should not be a problem. There are certain eponymous misnomers. There are a good list. Uh, a couple I have mentioned here, like Val Silva Maneuver was actually <laughs> discovered by Leonard of Dutta Pagalia, okay? But it was popularized by Val Silva, that's what it's called Val Silva Maneuver. Similarly, Crohn's disease. Okay, was first observed by Baxter Morgagni. Okay, but it was popularized by Braun, who had published it. So it became very popular. So that's why you know they say, you know, publish it or I mean, or publish it or perish it, or you'll perish. Because you know, whoever publish it, publishes it first, you know, uh, becomes uh, popular. The other uh, word which is uh, an eponymous misnomer is Gary's Ostermanitis. It's quite popular and it has been used for the periostractylis variant of the osteomyelitis, the chronic osteomyelitis, which is having periostractylis. But if you look at the actual description given by Gary, nowhere is mentioned about periostractylis. In fact, he has mentioned it as acute osteomyelitis, not even as chronic osteomyelitis. But some of the other Gary's osteomyelitis has been used for you know, chronic osteomyelitis with proliferative periostitis, though he has not actually you know, observed it and presented. So that is an eponymous misnomer. Anyway, so coming to the conclusion, what's in the name? A rose by any other name spells the same. This is a very popular quote by Shakespeare in Romeo and Juliet. You know? So Really, does it matter? You know, all these names which you have been talking about, you know, the etiology or rather the etymology of the names, you know, really, does it matter? It does matter, especially when you want to know the history of that particular word. It makes us understand about the disease better. And we also enjoy learning the subject. Okay? So I have started enjoying uh, learning of oral pathology because I've started looking at the etymology of all these words. Okay, in fact, even a lot of words in English. You know, I start uh, trying to find out how these phrases have come into existence. Okay, so and it makes me enjoy the subject. Or uh, like, for example, I don't know where all of you must have heard about the phrase "letting cat out of the bag." So do you know how that particular phrase came into existence? Well, letting you know, is not actually you know it's uh, during the olden days. When they wanted to sell uh, piglets, okay, they don't directly sell it. They put it in a sack, okay, and you know, the other person feels the piglet and then decides to purchase it. 
Okay. So some of these people who want to cheat the other person, instead of the piglet, they used to put a small kitten inside. Okay. So when this person starts feeling inside and he has a doubt, you know, is it really a piglet? And he opens the sack or the bag, the cat or the kitten comes up. So that is what is meant by letting cat out of the bag. That means letting out a secret. So all these phrases, all these names probably have some story to tell us. And if you know the stories, I'm sure you'll be able to enjoy the subject better. So with those few words, uh, I would like to conclude my topic. And these are the books and the websites which I've referred. Okay. A lot of information I've got from the websites. And uh, these four books are absolutely fantastic. Okay. If you can make a note of it later on, you'll be able to uh, understand the etymology of the words. You can always email your suggestions or you can ask me questions. And this is my email ID. So you can, you're free to contact me. Thank you so much. Thank you all. And now I'm open for questions. Thank you so much, uh, Subramanian sir. That was a very lucid presentation. And uh, starting from etymology, uh, then eponyms, eponyms, acronyms, everything. Right? It was it kept the audience uh, glued to their laptops and mobiles. Thank you so much. And I'm sure I, it must have taken a lot of efforts for you to assimilate this knowledge and put it in a very short uh, slide presentation and making it more interesting for the audience. I'm sure the student audience will go and ignite their brains might have ignited and they will go and search for the new no, they don't ignite me no. <laughs> <laughs> Sir, on the YouTube section I think uh, uh, Dr. Hatch had one uh, query uh, yeah. which I think you have already answered in your uh, uh, presentation Station. like uh, regarding the term candidiasis and candidosis. <laughs> So oh, okay. I think I got his answer now. And the uh, same thing with actinomycosis as well. Oh, and, I mean, uh, from most to what he has already mentioned, man. It's like, uh, no, of course, candidates and candidates, like, uh, no, this actually uh, was also brought up in you know, international naming of uh, diseases and all. So generally, when we name diseases, uh, especially syndrome, we use apostrophe, like Down syndrome, Tages disease. So the international uh, naming of diseases no, on group, so they said it is not correct. When you say Page's disease, that means as a Page is suffering from the disease. When you say Down syndrome, poor chap, as if he has got a syndrome. Okay. So they say that the apostrophe should not be there. It's like Perry Robin uh, sequence. Oh, Page disease, no Down syndrome. So again, this candidiasis, candidosis, also probably you know that confusion is still there. But uh, for a long time they have been using. The candidiasis. So I think uh, is, most of the text will still continue with it. Sir, and uh, uh, there is one more question like uh, Dr. Osmani has said regarding uh, Gorlin's tumor and Hutchinson's triad. To which yeah. etymology would they correspond? See, Hutchinson's triad is again, uh, Hutchinson is an epon. No? Even Gorlin is again an epon. Gorlin's cyst. No? These are all, uh, I mean, based on names of persons. Like, of course, they are persons who first observed them, okay? <laughs> so they are not sufferers. Like, Hutchinson, in fact, is quite popular. He has got Hutchinson's pupil, a good number of uh, you know, lesions described by Hutchinson. Thank you, sir. And uh, my, uh, I have uh, myself one uh, okay. query, uh, yeah. like uh, the Jogren syndrome. Some yeah. say it has Jogren syndrome, and while others say it has Sogren syndrome. So, uh, see, the thing is no. I mean, like in English, there's a rule about proper names. So, proper names can be pronounced any way they want. But uh, actually, I think the correct pronunciation is Jogren. But you can also go online. You know, there's a particular website called pronunciationnames.com. So, where you just type in the word of uh, the, or the name of the person. So, you get the correct pronunciation. So, I think correct pronunciation is Jogren. Hmm? Thank you so much, sir. Uh, that was. Uh, the, I guess uh, it's uh, silent. <laughs> so those are the only questions. Uh, otherwise, uh, everyone almost uh, eighty-five, uh, more than eighty-five people have logged in to YouTube, and most of them are saying hello. We have international audience also a lot oh, nice. of audience. Okay. So, thank you so much, sir. Uh, uh, Ma'am, uh, I now hand over it to you. you may, uh, and once again, I also thank, thank you, so you all. Yeah, thank you so much, Namiri. 
and uh, as i said see this interest in uh, origin of birds will continue okay so and there are so many birds that is not possible for me to talk about origin about all the birds you know in this small presentation so anytime anybody wants origin of any particular bird okay uh, if they are not able to find it online they feel to contact me you know uh, because i have a couple of books you know uh, on this etymology especially uh, one by skinner uh, and uh, in fact there's a separate book completely about medical economics you know? so i was lucky to some happy to get it in one of those you know old book shops <laughs> so i purchased it right? so the um, all of them are free to contact me anytime uh, because even if i do not know uh, i will definitely find out and get back to you because uh, this is something which i really enjoy thank you so much and uh, dr sandhya is telling uh, they are remembering your dadh and oral pad diagrams in mumbai <laughs> dy patel and okay. they are uh, still being used though they are faded they have been <laughs> still being uh, preserved and used as a treasure archives okay. maybe i'll i'll write for them again if you want <laughs> yes, sir yeah, even in davangere we know we had all those archives and uh, we had to redraw them after mandana ma <laughs> game <laughs> like because they get faded out Correct, so correct. It was to be a very amazing time which we had. So thank you, Abhi. Thank you so much. Sir. Thank you so much, Nandi. Thanks a lot. Nice. I, I would like to thank Mandana Mams for this opportunity again, ma'am. <laughs> so now I'll hand over. You're uh, welcome. I can see you thoroughly enjoyed yourself. <laughs> <laughs> so sorry, ma'am. In between, uh, my no, that's okay. No <laughs> worries. Those are so things sorry. that will keep the event memorable. Everybody remember it. There is one uh, one comment. I mean, there are lots huh. of comments. and oh, over 300 good or bad <laughs> around the world have been watching um oh. right from new zealand to the americas oh. we have had people logged in from every continent and uh, there is one from professor jos hille from uh, south africa this okay. i'm going to read because he says i have enjoyed an education in basic greek and latin at high school and it helped me in understanding medical terminology However, your lecture baked the cake and put a bright cherry on top of it. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> that that Thanks. was a very Thank nice. Thank you, sir. Comment. Thank you so much, sir. Yes, and now with that, I will. Uh, I don't think there are any more comments. Uh, there are, of course, a, a considerable amount of everybody saying a great lecture. uh amazing and what a way to come back and i can see we have all been missing you in our uh, lecture scene so we are actually quite happy you're back so and we hope to see more Maybe of you i should say like you know arnold schwarzenegger no i am back <laughs> yes i'm back yes you're back <laughs> and we are happy to have you back thank you so yes. much man they are most welcome thank you once again i should thank you madam for giving me this opportunity uh, no no it's oh. always great to have people like you as <laughs> have you so every much. lecture that is there is just taking us one step closer to having uh, you know oral pathology up there so <laughs> oral pathology oral medicine dentistry yeah man that's it everybody's contribution so thank you for your contribution thank you there is one more uh, message from dr nazir he says uh, uh, super flow of uh, lesion and path derivation So all all your algorithms are being uh, very useful, sir. So thank you, sir. Thank you again, sir. Yes. Now I shall just do this. Right. It's so, done, man. Thank you, sir. Can thank you, you so much, man. Thanks a lot. Share. Yeah. Yes, and yeah. uh, it was really very interesting. Uh, oh, totally this will be automatically available now, man. Online, oh, on YouTube. Sorry? Will it take some time? This YouTube link will be already available online once you. It is already there, and it will continue to be there full time. It I, I okay. do not withdraw it, so okay, it continues there. And okay. so that is your certificate, sir. And uh, <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much, Madam. Thanks a lot. You are most <laughs> welcome. And Nandini dear, here is your certificate. Thank you so much, ma'am. I'm sorry for the trouble in between. Oh, please don't say that. Yeah, okay. <laughs> That's okay. That's okay, Nandini. It's okay. So now we have a few more things to share. So please yeah. just stay on. Yes. Sure. First is to all the viewers. I mean, around seventy-five of you have messaged today, and uh, I'm floored. Thank you, thank you all. Uh, it is. I I can't really read everybody's names, but it has been amazing, and so many from around the world, from India. I I, I am floored. 
thank you thank you all so much i do hope you will join us again and i do hope all of you thoroughly enjoyed that uh session and yes thank you really thank you this is not possible without the viewers this is just not possible yes. now coming to yeah, next week next week we have another certificate enabled session it's a combined dentistry first or dentistry special series and of course beyond borders the speaker is uh, professor lakshman samarnaike and uh, he is going to be talking about covid 19 vaccines and the dental team so this is going to be interesting and i have a little uh, point to make here i am looking for my expert panel still for this talk who i need are is a, a clinical dentist with a lot of experience in handling uh, this cases at this point of time who can moderate the session and i'm also looking for preferably an immunologist or an infectious diseases expert again with experience on the management of covid if any of you know anyone who can sit in uh, please contact me and let me know that will complete our you know panel and the discussion we can have so that will be wonderful if you can help out please send me the names i would love to know who uh, could be included and anyways i'm also looking so we shall have people definitely i guess we have i've not let you down so far so it won't happen this time either and uh, with that thank you so much thank you everybody see you next week connect with me on the many 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 social networking sites that i have given there and it will be great you will be able to hear whatever is happening with that have a wonderful week see you tuesday Yes, I have stopped the live stream. Okay, okay, man. <laughs> okay. Okay, man. Thank you so much. Hi, yo.